in a vast wasteland of entertainment where radio has become obsolete stands an embittered man what? teetering at the edge of sanity. sanity. With help from radio friends, he's about to embark on a global mission that would change the course of history as we know it. Broadcasting live from the secret studios on the banks of the Brandywine River in Delaware is Mitchell K.C. Hill. And up to the Great White North in Vancouver is Alexander Knight. All right, there we are, the big intro. We're a little late today, but uh, the folks in the podcast will have no idea this happened. It's just one of those timey-wimey things. But, uh, hi, it's Mitch Hill uh, from The Last Angry DJ, Episode 6, and a great guest who you'll find about in just a second. But right now, let's go above the Canadian border up to my good friend, Alexander Knight, coming to us from Port Coquitlam, right outside of Vancouver. Take a bow, Alexander. Thanks, Mitch. Yeah, I'm super happy to be here. Uh, today, we've got an acclaimed broadcaster, Canadian broadcaster. And, uh, you know, when I was growing up, one of the stations that I listened to every single day was C Fox, the world famous C Fox, as they, as they like to call themselves. So we have broadcaster Larry Hennessy here. He is also a music uh, nerd and mic nerd uh, as well. So we're going to talk to him about his vintage mic collection a little bit later. We want to talk a little bit about his uh, his broadcast life, how he got into the industry. So thanks very much for uh, being on the show, Larry. Honor to be here with you guys and everybody. Hello from the beautiful oh, sunshine at... coast of British Columbia. And he looks like he has joined the AKG microphone family. What do you got there? See? You you told me you told me uh, you were going to use your AKG four fourteen. So I thought, well, I mean, you know, we got to be twinsies. Right. And apparently now, uh, uh, the, your your other friend here is using one as well. It's it's it, like we have three of them. Yeah, Mitch has the newer the XLS. I've got the ULS model Whoa. that they don't make anymore. Whoa. What is the one you got there? Is that the? Is this that one's a... from about the uh, early nineties. Uh, I don't. I'm... Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, lovely, how does one decide? Lovely microphone. I'm I'm curious. How do you decide what microphone you're going to use? If you have over 500 microphones, you just walk into that closet. Uh, how do you make that decision? Well, uh, I found uh, in the early days. I'm going to show something to you. Yes, my company has over 500 microphones. As a matter of fact, I have a box of microphones that I've just purchased from an auction, which I'll uh, I'll show you in a bit. But uh, this one here, this is the first microphone I ever owned. This is a uh, this is from an Akai tape machine, and uh, basically it was an accessory. I paid eighteen dollars for it, and so this is the first microphone I ever owned. Um, as a kid, I was fascinated with speakers. I would go into public places and I would go, "Where are the speakers?" Uh, and <laughs> after uh, I I started singing choirs when I was like in the womb, singing with my mother, and then uh, uh, I I grew up in Newfoundland and then Wabash, Labrador, and and when I was I think in grade six, the CBC came to record the choir. Uh, and it's very isolated mining town, Wabash, Labrador at that time. Uh, no roads in there. Uh, and so they brought us into the uh, the gymnasium and they were setting up all this equipment. And the teacher came over to me and said, uh, Larry, Tim Cole is sick. And so you're going to have to sing the solo. Now, you have to understand it was the shyest child alive and that person is still living in the back of my head, although it's become very, very quiet. Uh, and so they, she took me over and put me in front of one of these. Can you see this microphone here? This yeah, is so a RCA like an RCA 44. Oh yeah. RCA nice. 44 microphone. And so push me up to that. And, uh, I believe it was a Christmas concert. So it was like, Oh, holy night or something. And, uh, you know, I sang my bit and I, I, I go back to that over and over again as kind of being the beginning of my fascination with microphones. And so much like uh, people who like classic cars or, you know, you can quote uh, the Simpsons episodes, uh, you know, what line, what happened, which episode number, uh, you know, I, I see microphones. It's my wife. We're, we're watching movies and I go, oh, that's interesting. That microphone's not from the right time period or et cetera, et cetera. So. I, I I see microphones and I I can uh, identify them and you know, Larry that's a that's a great story I have exactly the same story to tell down Do here in the uh, you know, lower states but uh, in my case I came up to a, it was like an AKG of some vintage and they grabbed me and shoved me up in front of it and of course it wasn't balanced and it wasn't uh, properly grounded and when I put my lips oh. up to it to sing the Christmas Carol I went holy shit wow 
because That's, my lips uh, were attached to the mic and they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't come off. So That's similar amazing. story, different uh, inspiration. That's apparently uh, the, the the one that they had at the CBC was balanced. So and, and I didn't get to touch it at all. So uh, so then, you know, going through broadcasting and uh, I started broadcasting in 1975 in Wabash, Labrador um, and uh, have worked right across the country. And of course, uh, I just became totally fascinated with uh, the equipment. I love the equipment. I, I love the broadcasting part. I love the creation and the communication and dealing with people, but I also love, love the equipment. And that got me into production studios. So that allowed me to do the old, uh, you know, uh, record on one tape machine and overdub onto another machine, less right. Paul sound style, on sound. sound on sound. So I've, you know, I've been doing that all my life. So now I'm at the point where I, uh, as a musician, I'm a multi player. I, I can play anything badly. So I do what I call a five hour song, which is I, I write the song and I play all the instruments, et cetera, and then make a video for it. And, uh, and you know, a few people see it here and there. And it's just, I love vintage equipment and I am surrounded by it everywhere I go. Uh, well, I How think do you feel? Uh, what's it like being a vintage uh, disc jockey on Jack <laughs> FM? I don't, uh, you know, I don't feel old. I don't feel old whatsoever. I, I know I am. I'm about to be 64. Uh, but I just, I don't feel it. Um, and perhaps it's, uh, partially to do with attitude and et cetera. I am so jacked about being on, on Jack. Um, uh, my partner, uh, Willie and I, who I'm sure Alex, Alexander is yeah, we'll uh, familiar with, that. uh, Will, Willie and I were part of the, uh, the basis of the whole Jack idea and the Jack format. Um, and so we were on that station doing the morning show for many, many years after C Fox. Uh, and so I returned to there now where I do an eighties music show, but I'm playing vinyl records in real time. And unlike what radio wants most people to do, which is to talk about hairstyles or movies or pop culture crap from back then, I focus entirely on the music. And I've noticed that there's a bit of a change in the industry now where people there was there was a point when the ppm rating system came out that was like oh people don't care about that never talk about you know the actual thing that's all i talk about and i've noticed now uh, in some cases that that has not necessarily by by my efforts but it's i i hear that now and it seems to be acceptable again and that people are interested it's all i do uh i talk only about the artists and the music uh, and I do three times a day, I do a feature on vinyl and I tell a story behind how the song was made or what was going on when the song was going down, et cetera, et cetera. It's absolutely fantastic. And it's such a joy to do. Yeah. And clearly, uh, clearly someone with, with your breadth of, of knowledge too, in the music industry, that really does come through. And, uh, you, you know, one of the things I noticed, and you, you mentioned this too, about the state of the industry and how things have changed uh, I've noticed a drastic change, uh, you know, since, since, uh, I started listening to C Fox in the nineties and I've noticed mm. in general, um, and I know a little bit about this cause I went to broadcast school. It, it was a bit weird late in life cause I never really wanted to be on the radio. And I worked in the tech industry for over 15 years. And when I got laid off in, in 2014, I decided, what am I going to do with my life? And I had already been podcasting, been doing it for 13 years. So I went back to broadcast school and I noticed things were very different. Uh, they've decided now that they want people to just use their natural voice, that, that big radio voice, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of, it's, it's not yeah. really enforced anymore. They, they want people to talk naturally. And I noticed yep. that radio Absolutely. in general to me, I, and I, and I listen to a lot of radio stations to me, it seems like it's gone a little bit boring. It's not as entertaining. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, I feel like it's lost its edge a little bit. All, all my favorite yeah. people, well, with the exception of you. But like, I remember when I listened to you guys, Larry, the Larry and Willie show, I mean, you guys were pretty edgy and you got, the two of you guys mm -hmm. had a great chemistry and you were super, super funny. And I actually, I just wanted to share with this with you. I don't know why this stuck in my head, but you know, you always think of people on the radio as being super polished, at least I think the majority of people do. Uh, Until but I remember, we came along. <laughs> uh, but I remember one time I'm listening to you guys and I, I don't know if it was you or Willie, but you you went off mic and you started throwing F-bombs and, and I'm just oh, yeah. wondering what the hell is happening here? And I believe one of you fell off your chair live on the air. Mm. 
<laughs> sure. It was the funniest yeah. thing, and that just stuck in my memory. I'm like, wow, radio is not. I don't know perfect. about f bombs. You know, one of my I'm not I'm not a big uh, I'm not a big swear. You know, either personally, although I'll tell you lately, lately I've been dropping a few f bombs myself. But uh, but my part of my main task during the whole uh, exercise of Larry and Willie days was to keep because. I, I was, you know, producing the show, I was operating the equipment, and uh, my main job was to make sure that the microphones were off at the right time and on at the right time. Uh, so I don't believe we ever had too many leaks of uh, of any expletives. Uh, yeah, there, although- there's a there's a radio rule that basically says if you're in a room with a microphone, trust it to be on. Yeah. Even if you well, think it's off. Well, my memory is that's the way it is. Maybe, that's the rule, but it didn't happen anywhere I was, I'll tell you. So isn't that a bit nerve wracking, though, when you got to push all these buttons and you're trying to produce a show and you're trying to be a good yeah. host and be engaging, but then yeah. you're worrying about you don't got anybody else operating the board. Mm-hmm. Well, and uh, different days, too. I mean, now... Uh, once, uh, once automation came into radio, I'd go into the control room when there was actually people there, I'd go in and somebody would be sitting back watching TV with their feet up and the thing in auto. And I would go sit up, you know, can I give you a little advice? Sit up, take it out of auto and produce the show yourself. Because guess what? Somebody's going to walk in here at the wrong time and see you with your feet up watching the Flintstones, uh, and the things in auto. And they're going to go like, we don't need you anymore. And guess what happened? We don't need you anymore. Uh, I, I also remember then as time went by and when at one point on Jack, we were the only, we were the only live show. Uh, and you would come in later in the day and the lights would be off and the volume would be down in the control room. And I, right. I, you know, I, I said to anybody that will listen, I'll say it now, the most important room in the building has become the least important room in the building. Go in there. The volume's down. The lights are off. Come on, man. That's, yeah. What, you know, hello. There, nice there used to be got up here. There used to be a lot of attention to detail because uh, back in the 70s yeah. when I entered radio, um, spinning my own records was a challenge. And when I say records, we we played 45s and 33s, and we played NAB carts, which were cart machines that had little short audio uh, segments on them. There was no automation back then. There were no Mm. computers. There was no internet. So you had to concentrate on the mechanics of doing a show. So I'm just telling this to Alex so he has a perspective on it. And then later on, uh, when I went to the big markets, uh, we had engineers uh, pushing the buttons. And all I had to turn on was my mic and give them a cue to, you know, seg to the next thing or what was the next item to, to play. But today... Like you say, it's all automated. It's all on computer, and all you're doing is sequencing. So you're hitting the next next event, next event. Or right. if you're on auto, like you just said, uh, that's it's a, just that's, you, could, you could lie down on the floor, and it would just keep uh, going. But so yeah. that's if you're actually there. So back to your comment, Alex, about about the spark going out of things. Um, if you have somebody that's sitting in a room, uh, and they're voice tracking five stations a day, which is pretty typical now. So you're you know, you're on, which, you know, it's, it's fantastic, but yet all you're doing is you're hearing that last four seconds of down and da, 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 and you're coming on and, you know, doing your bit in 10 minutes, I'll tell you about blah, 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 uh, hook, hook, hook. And then, you know, you're doing that for all these stations. How can you focus? How can you, you have to be a super talent to make all of that compelling and make all that interesting. So I think what's happened is that it's just, everybody's overwhelmed. The people that run the places are overwhelmed with HR. Uh, that's become more important in a lot of companies. Uh, you know, the actual, the actual doing the business, uh, which we're in the business of entertaining and entertaining people. That's uh, you know, that's that's just a byproduct of trying to make sure everybody's taking the la- latest, uh, you know, uh, deck on right. social relationships or whatever. Which you know. It has its place as well, of course. Um, but I think that from the bottom to the top, everybody is just overwhelmed. So where, where are you getting time to be creative? Where are you getting time to, to right. think? You know, one, one of the things about doing live radio and playing vinyl is that while that's playing for four minutes, this gives me time to formulate. And I'm sure, Mitch, you remember that yourself. Uh, it gives you time to formulate. What am I going to do next? How does this work into the next element? How can I create? Uh, it isn't, it isn't, I'm just doing, you know, five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever. Right. So, so I think, I think the creativity, um, beyond it, not being a popular thing, <laughs> it's just, there's just no time for it. And, the, and, yeah, and, it. and, and so what Alex's do you think about, 
what do you think Go about, because uh, this drives me nuts, is I feel like the human voice, if you're on the radio, that's that's your instrument. That is muscle that you need to exercise. But I feel like, uh-huh. and this was my observation from two years in broadcast school, that, that there was a little bit of training, but not a whole lot. And I f- mm. also felt like the students didn't really take it seriously. I mean, vocal fry is one yeah. of the things that drives me absolutely insane. Yeah. I even hear it on modern day presenters, but I feel like absolutely. a lot of that is learned behavior. And I feel like if you work at it, you could even take a vocal coach in extreme circumstances. To, but I feel like you need to work on that. And I don't really, I, I feel like mm. the, the drive isn't there from a lot of people. I don't, you know, uh, although at my age and I've been doing this so long that, you know, oh, you sound like a broadcaster. Well, this is just my voice now. I mean, I, I didn't always sound like this. I'm not trying to sound like, I can sound like, I can sound like, I can sound like, I can sound like anything. This is just my normal speaking voice. And so, so even, even when I'm, if, if I'm doing a, an introduction on top of a very, you know, up-tempo, exciting song, then uh, I think you might, uh, you might describe it as Ronnie Radio. A little too much so i'm trying to avoid that part of it but i'm also trying to i'm trying to be excited about it but you know what the voice is not the main thing the main thing of broadcasting is communication and and co- connecting with somebody in a story or uh or information um that's that is what has always been most important if we go back to the 70s and a lot of older broadcasters like oh well those were the days in broadcasting okay so what did you do 10 minutes after seven o'clock a cloudy day out there garbage day seven and uh oh 10 minutes after seven o'clock with casey and the sunshine band on the big seven Okay, so those are the great yeah, days of broadcasting. I resemble that remark. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> you know, so so uh, you know the di- I, the different the difference was that you spoke down or out to people as if you're on right. Mount Olympus, and some radio yes. stations even went so far as put reverb sure. to make you sound bigger than life. Uh, and to Alex's point, um, we were trained to have the big radio voices. We were trained to talk like this. 825 on CKLW or whatever, either the way you were talking nowadays mm. is completely different. I still sound like an AM disc jockey. I'm stuck with it. I train for yeah. it and it's, it's, it's in my life. And I agree. I think that people want to be talk, talked to, not yeah. at, which is the main difference between it. Yeah. Tell stories. What's important. This is a funny one. My mom, when I first started, started broadcasting, God bless my mother, Catherine Hennessy, Katie Hennessy. Oh, uh, she, she came one evening, I came, came back from being on the radio and she said, I was listening to you. I go, oh, well, thank you. Uh, does that hurt your throat when you do that? <laughs> <laughs> My mom Mama. was the same way. She would call me on the hotline. It would ring. She said, Mitch, it's not, ec- it's not accessory. It's accessory. Oh, well. It's not July. It's July. She would be right on it. And, uh, oh, she was my awesome. collaborator. So awesome support. God bless our mothers. Yeah. So Larry, yeah, I, I want to get, let's get into the, uh, the sort of inception of the Larry and Willie show. Cause, and I, hopefully the internet is not wrong on the data that I got, but, uh, I believe it started in 1988 and it ran at least till what was mm-hmm. it? 99 or 2000. Cause you guys moved to Goes Rockwell. Before then, Wendy. man. Before that. Goes before then, man. Okay, well, give, give us, give us the story. How did that thing, how did you guys meet? I was working in Thunder Bay, Ontario at CKPR Radio, and a gentleman by the name of Ray D. was the program director. In previous years, a guy named Don Percy had done the morning show there, and Don is an absolute legendary broadcaster, incredible storyteller, funny, funny, creative. Wow, what a guy. So he was a legend and still is in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Winnipeg, and Edmonton. Um. The main competing station at the time uh, in the AM radio days um, decided to put two people, a man and a woman, on as a morning team. And this was a new thing. And so Ray thought to himself, well, Christ, what now? I've, what am I going to do about this? So he phoned up Don Percy and he said, uh, Mike McCoy is doing the morning show here. And uh, across the street, as he as he described it, that was usually the term used for 
the competing radio station across the street. They got two people on there now. Like uh, I got to put somebody in here with Mike. Do you know anybody? And so Don goes, well, my son, Willie is on the air in Powell river, British Columbia, and he's doing a two man show with a newsman. And, uh, it's, you know, I've heard tapes of it and they sound good. And Ray goes, Oh, okay. Tell him to send me a tape. So, Don contacts Willie. Willie sends Ray a tape, and eventually they decide that they're going to hire Willie to team up with Mike McCoy. Mike McCoy at that point was 33. Willie was 21. So I hear that Willie Percy is coming to work, and at this point I'm doing uh, all the station imaging. I'm doing production. I'm doing an evening thing. I'm programming music. Um, But I knew, because I worked in Winnipeg, we used to do all nights or swing shifts, and we would get off, and we'd go and listen to Don Percy, the master of the morning in Winnipeg, because he was that good. So I hear that Willie Percy is coming to CKPR, and I go like, holy crap, that's Don Percy's son. So the unfortunate thing for Willie was that Ray decided he wasn't going to tell anybody. It was all on the down low as to why he was coming to the station. So they set him up in the copy room, the the commercial production room, with the three people that were there. And everybody's like, who is this guy and why is he here? I can't tell you. No. So now there's like, okay, is he, is he going to take my job, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't care about any of that stuff. All I knew was like, here's this dude. He's Don Percy's son. Hey, Will, what's going on? So right away, we were, you know, we were cool. So Willie sat for about a month working on bits, uh, features, et cetera. And by the time he was going to come in with Mike, he had all these, uh, you know, features all written up, all these gags, all this fantastic stuff. Willie was a stand-up comedian as well, right? In the early days down in Gastown. He was, he was a stand-up with a lot of the major comedians, uh, you know, Jim Carrey, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, wow. he was like 17, 18. That's crazy. Yeah, doing stand-up with these guys, like these legends, you know? And so he picked up an incredible amount of stuff from that. So uh, when it came time to go on the air, uh, Mike didn't, um, Mike said to Willie while they're, while they're sitting on the first morning, he says, well, I guess they're looking to have, uh, you know, arseholes and idiots on the air now. Well, he goes, what do you mean? Well, they hired you. So, you know, welcome to the show. <laughs> so uh, Willie, Willie would go, okay, I've got this bit about going to the grocery store and, uh, you know, they mix up the bag and I end up with like, uh, you know, uh, uh, a whole bunch of makeup and like what happened. So he's got a bit and he goes, all you say at the end is like, wow, that's never happened to me either or whatever the line is. And so Willie does this thing. I'm at the store. I'm at the time. And he goes boom to Mike and Mike's silent and does nothing. And so the whole thing falls apart. So within a couple of days, uh, Mike says, that's it. That's enough of you. I'm going in to tell them that, you know, got to get rid of you. And so the next day he did. And uh, Ray said, God bless you, Ray. Um, Ray said, no, it's not him we're going to get rid of. It's you. And so then he came to me and he said, uh, and Ray, <laughs> Ray, Ray had his very, very uh, own um, way of communicating. And he said, uh, Hennessy, I want you in there with the kid. Do you want to do it? Because he called Willie the kid. And I said, of course I'll do it. And so the next morning we went in. And, uh, we went, okay. So I went, okay, I'll back sell the song station ID song weather. And then you'll pick up with the bit and then we'll continue on. And so right away, uh, right away, we sounded like, Oh, you know, we sounded like something. And so by the time the first rating came back, the morning ratings were up 30%. And so this Whoa. continued and, that's uh, incredible. Uh, Rick Hansen, Man in Motion, because I'm a Newfoundlander, I noticed, oh, Rick Hansen is now, he's been around the world. He's coming towards Thunder Bay. In a month, he's going to be coming to Thunder Bay. We should start fundraising for him. And so we did, we did so much. We raised something like $25,000 with the good people of Thunder Bay, Ontario. So much so that when Rick Hansen came, he came in on our show. Um, and so it was, that's what I'm talking about, about dealing, you know, finding a way to, to deal with people. We, we had a, um, 
we had one of the things we did back then, which is a, a fairly famous thing. It was an April Fool's gag where at the time the love boat was a, a huge television show. And so one of us came up with the idea and always on April Fool's, we, we would come up and, and, you know, with, with a big plan. One of us came up with the idea that the love boat was going to be coming into the Harbor. Thunder Bay is a Harbor town. Uh, most of the shipments of grain from Canada used to go in very large ships, salties and, and freshwater boats down through the locks, Lake Superior on down. So it, it wasn't, it wasn't too far fetched that a big ship might come into the Harbor. So we came on in the morning and we had the news guy, Tim Gable, who was pretending to be captain Steubing on the phone. Ah, uh, yes, we're, uh, we're going to be coming in, uh, you know, plugging his nose. Yeah, we're coming in and, uh, you know, we'll be in at noon and, uh, we have the mayor is giving a, a special presentation, uh, a big plaque. Apparently uh, it's going to be blah, blah, blah. So we're like, Oh my God. So all morning long, we're like the love boat at noon. You're going to see it in the Harbor, et cetera. The mayor, Jack masters at the time was listening to the radio. He goes, mayor is giving a plaque. And he goes, what? So he goes into, he goes into city hall and the receptionist or his assistant or whoever is there. And he says, Jamie, you got to tell me what's going on because I just heard I'm giving out a plaque to the love boat. And she goes, <laughs> Jack, look at the date. He looks up April 1st. So at noon, we get in Willie's car and we drive down to the, the Harbor and we go, okay, let's see if anybody's down there. We get down there and there's 500 people, 500 oh cars. God. <laughs> we turn around and get the hell out of there is what we did. So that gag <laughs> uh, is, you know, it's, it's a famous thing. And so we, we, uh, we decided that very quickly, probably within six months or so that we were way more powerful together then we were apart, uh, and that we should try and take this, um, to see where else we can go. So in about a year and a half together, we put together, uh, air checks recordings of the show, which is what you did then. And you mailed out a physical tape, uh, to stations. We tried six or seven stations in Ontario. We got a response from, I think, Orangeville, but Willie having lived in Vancouver and knowing about Fox went, no, where we should go is the West Coast. So we sent tapes to Calgary, and we sent tapes to Victoria and to Seafox, um, and we received responses from them all, one particularly from Victoria saying, yeah, I don't hear much of what you're doing, but thanks, you know, one of those letters. But we got a call from Ross Winters. Ross is presently, uh, I think, the president of programming for Patterson. Hey, Ross. And his job at that time was to listen to all the tapes that came in for Moffat Radio when Fox is on Richard Street. And so he heard us and he pulled the tape out and he put it into possibles. Um, so then we got a call saying, uh, we got your tape and it's quite obvious to us that you guys are pattering yourselves after Mark and Brian in Los Angeles. And we went, oh, because no internet or whatever, you, right, could, yeah. you know, unless yeah. somebody sent you a tape, you would not hear Mark and Brian. But they eventually mailed us a tape from Vancouver, Ross and, and Jim Johnson. And uh, we heard Mark and Brian. We went like, holy crap, we do sound like Mark and Brian. That's amazing. So Jim uh, Johnson, J.J. Johnson, legendary program director and, you know, incredible mentor. He, I think, wanted jake edwards he wanted brother jake to come to see fox in vancouver to do the show so he flew to toronto and jake it just didn't work out so then he flew to thunder bay to meet us and when he got off the plane he got in a taxi and he he said to make conversation with the cabbie he said uh oh i'm new in town uh, what's cool on the radio here and the cabbie all the way to the hotel talked about larry and willie larry and willie larry and willie larry and willie and so oh so then we went to meet uh, Jim, and uh, he said, you know, you're rough, <laughs> but I think I can do something with you guys. I, uh, I want you to come and do mornings at Fox in Vancouver. And at that point, I had to like, I know, I, I knew Vancouver is a beautiful place. I knew that uh, people never leave Vancouver once they, <laughs> once they got a yeah, job in those yeah. days. Like, you know, it was, Vancouver was the same. This is another reason why when we got to Vancouver, our show was so interesting because Vancouver was Doc Harris and Vancouver was very smooth. Even FM was FM uh, very, very cool. And, uh, you know, uh, 
I'm, uh, I'm way too cool for this. Let's get into some Floyd. And so that was Vancouver radio then. So we showed up and we we're actually two guys talking to each other, putting people on the radio and announcing their lost dogs. This didn't happen in Vancouver radio. Um, so we sounded the reason, the reason that we, it was easier for us to break out of the normal Vancouver scene at that point. It was that we sounded so different. It was two people talking right. to each other. And now when I see video of us as young guys together, even just hanging out together. And, uh, I know that the next time I sit with Willie, uh, it'll be the same feeling. Ha! Ah, emotions. That's okay. It'll be the same feeling. There, there's just an electricity between us that when I look at those old videos, I go like, holy crap, you're just on fire. On fire. Incredible. And did you know while you were on the air that you guys were making history for Vancouver Radio? No. Did you? Could you, you, you had no instinctive feeling no. that something was... <laughs> no. Well, that's uh, interesting. <laughs> No, we were uh, we were at that time being uh, coached, let's say, daily, um, overcoached. So what happens with overcoaching for all you coaches out there uh, and all you personalities and anybody that is being coached? Um, when you are overcoached, suddenly you don't know what the heck to say, and it just stops the stream in your head, and it stops the creativity. So thank you for your advice. Now leave and let us do what we do. It, uh, it, the first so six months... Mitch, sorry, this first six months, uh, we, when we first went into CFOX, you could feel the power in the room. No cell phones, no internet. So this thing was crazy. Uh, like the whole city was tuned into that station. When we went in the room, there were six phone lines and they were always on hold. The first thing we would do was take them off hold and we would answer every call. Not only that, I always had a tape machine rolling. And so that every call that came in was recorded. And suddenly you're getting all these like, incredibly interesting people uh just you know batshit interesting people uh and and we're putting them on the air and so now they're so my theory was take take this power and give it to people when you give the power to people now they're invested in it east van mike uh salam the deli guy you know all these people became characters on the show and meanwhile all the other cool Coming up in a moment, the rock report. All those people had all the phones on hold because they were superstars. We had we had no interest in being superstars. We had interest in stirring up stuff and making ourselves laugh and be right. creative and get in touch with people. And that's we, what drove us all the time. And when you guys were were developing uh, the show and what you and you know planning prepping all your material and stuff like that, uh, did you? Were you just doing what you thought you wanted to hear or did you with intention go, well, we're going to do, we see what everybody else is doing. We're going to do the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. Just curious what was, what you were thinking at the time. That was, and still is, uh, one of my main, um, things in Willie as well. It's like, everybody's doing that. We're going to do this. Uh, we would have something like kiss radio in the day, which is now Jack it was an incredibly powerful adult contemporary station uh with fred latrimo doing mornings of the legend and they uh there's a number of things that we we did with kiss but they had a contest one of those don't say hello say uh say i listened to kiss and uh you know win ninety seven thousand dollars so we did a whole bunch of riffing on that making fun of it and et cetera, et cetera. but then we went okay we're trying to come up with a new contest uh instead of making it so easy we, we thought you know what we'll do is we'll just have a contest that says if you say hello we'll pay you out hello hey we got a winner and so very quickly that would be that would, nice. like that would be funny a few <laughs> times but for a whole month no so then we went okay if if that's the easiest thing to do with our friend rob gray and tim charles willie and i we sat around and we jammed on, all right, if it's so easy to win, let's go the other way and make it incredibly tough to win. And so we invented the toughest contest. And that contest was truly the, it was, it was about three years before um, Fear Factor, Survivor, et cetera. It was, it was reality television. It was reality on the radio. Um, and that contest was copied around the world bits from that contest that are, our, our ideas are still being copied 
uh, by anybody that's halfway creative. Um, so we, our main thing was to, to entertain ourselves and the business was different then in that you didn't need to throw things up and see, you know, uh, what does Toronto think about it? You know, no, right. it's, if you, right. if you thought about it today, you could do it tomorrow. Matter of fact, we did it tomorrow and you didn't ask anybody about it. So it was do it and take the crap for it later. And our intention was never to be obnoxious. It was never, it was always with good intent to entertain and to be amusing and, and to be supportive for people. Unlike shock radio and, uh, Hey, you know, I'm just gonna, here's my, uh, here's my ass on the phone. You know, like we weren't interested in that. We, we purposely went, okay, there are other stations that are doing that kind of thing. Shock radio, <laughs> big deal. So, so you, you resisted the temptation to do a absolutely. morning zoo. Uh, yeah. Morning zoo was, was different than shock in Canada. Anyways, Dean Hill and the morning zoo were top of Vancouver radio. Uh, and Dean's a good friend of mine. We're top of uh, Vancouver radio when we when we arrived. They weren't doing that kind of stuff. It was just very funny, entertaining. That's all it is. And so we purposely went, okay, the guy, Jake Edwards, brother Jake, he was a master at doing that kind of stuff. So that's what Jake was doing. We purposely thought we are not going to be offensive because they will, as soon as it's offensive over there, What's mom going to do in those days in the 80s and 90s? It's tune over here. We were never offensive in that way. And it was always good intentions. And so that was something that we conceived that we want to make it, uh, we want to make this a safe place for anybody to listen. Although, you know, if we go back and hear tapes of, of those days, it was different times. And we, you know, we jammed on stuff that may be considered inappropriate now. But believe me, it was always with good intention and from the heart. And it was just to make fun of authority, to make fun of BS and to uh, just to have fun and entertain. Well, that's, so that's you were doing we were woke, on. you were doing woke before woke was uh, popular uh, as far as I wouldn't say we were, I wouldn't say we were woke, but All right, uh, you skated around it a wee bit. Yeah. Um, not, not so much, but it, it was the, the thing was never to do something to be offensive. I mean, that's, I still don't believe in that whatsoever. And it's particularly now, if there's anybody still doing that kind of stuff, I know it's still probably popular in some parts of the U S or somewhere like, don't you think there is enough misery and yeah, like the world has got enough, well, like we don't need that right now. We, we need, don't, we, we need don't honest entertainment, you know? And, and my recollection, I mean, I didn't listen from the beginning, but I, my recollection was that the show, the general brand of the two uh, of you guys was just, um, very just just like like you said, with good intentions, just liking the mm -hmm. you guys enjoyed poking fun at things, but it was all yeah. very. Um, I, I I don't recall anything that you guys ever said that was I would consider offensive or mean spirited or any. You didn't talk down to people, you know. You just it was all about the punchline and making people feel good so, at the end of the day and just you know whatever issues or worries people had when they were driving to work maybe they were dealing with mm. a traffic uh you know on the way to work and they're just stressed and they're pissed off and it was anything to kind of provide some levity in people's lives and i think that's what we everybody likes to do on the radio that's 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 your job so i uh, that's that was always my memory of the show, you know, one of the questions that I have with you is about because we talk about this a lot about the state of the broadcast industry, how things were, how they are now, how they need to change in order to survive. What kind of changes, not necessarily at CFOX, but obviously you you guys were there for a long time, well over a decade. But what kind of culture shifts shifts have you seen at at various radio stations in the industry at large from the '90s into the 2000s? How how do you see? the industry and how, how have things changed for better or worse? And how do you think it's going to survive? We were at C Fox for 15 years, 15 great years, one bad week is how I like to describe it. <laughs> uh, it was amazing days back then. Uh, literally you could feel the electricity in the room. I mean, I remember, I remember, uh, so again, pre cell phone, pre internet, uh, pre even, uh, even rental videos, right? So imagine that world. Alex, uh, you know, so, so movies in theaters, uh, and radio and television. I mean, that's, that's what it was. You couldn't rent, you know, the when the video games are like, uh, you know, a little past pong at that point. Uh, so 
So it was a, a whole different world. Uh, people were not people were looking to be entertained. So so it was uh, we once had two tickets for you two, and we said we're going out to Surrey and we're gonna we're gonna go to uh, uh, to Guilford Mall and you know somewhere around noon. Blah blah blah. We got there and there was five thousand people there for two tickets. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. So so that is a description of what that was about. It was an absolute whirlwind, uh, and uh, I remember it all with incredible joy. And truly, it was, um, you know, morning, noon, and night um, creativity. Uh, eventually, we got into producing um, television commercials. Yeah, we were one of the first um, nonlinear people producing. I mean, way before anybody now. Now it's just part of the gig to produce some sort of social media or content or whatever. I mean, we were doing that in my basement, uh, producing TV commercials, uh, eventually web content. Uh, I mean, er and then everything we thought of would have a video content along with it. Uh, our toughest contest, we did, uh, we did a television show that was one of the highest rated shows. Um, you know, so so from those days, that was an entirely an entirely different world and a and a and a, a different time. And uh, as time went on, um, we we realized that at Sea Fox, we were kind of becoming uh, the older uncles at the party. So you know, I it was great for me with my kids because uh, I could uh, you know I I knew more about some forty one than they did. Uh, you know, in those days. Oh, that's funny. So. You know, uh, so we that that was <laughs> that that was pretty cool. Um, just we re we realized that we were that we needed to move. We thought we would move to to uh, Rock One Hundred One, uh, and that we would take our audience over, and that C Fox would then be able right. to keep developing, playing new yeah. rock, and et cetera, et cetera. And for and for the listeners that are watching now that uh, maybe don't live in Canada, Rock One Hundred One obviously played older music, so the, presumably the, the demographic was going to be, like you said, that seems like the next yeah. logical transition. We're right. a little older now, maybe we'll be more appreciated with a slightly, yeah. like our we want our audience to move with us kind of That's thing. right. That's yeah. exactly right. And so uh, it's a very long story and a fascinating one, but um, a whole bunch of stuff went down with a change in management and a change in expectations and et cetera, et cetera. And so we realized, okay, uh, it's not going to happen with chorus. So what about Rogers? And at that time, Gary Miles, Sandy Sanderson, Rael Merson, these guys, lovely people, they were interested. Uh, Gary Miles uh, was from the real old school in that he believed if you paid somebody that was able to uh, bring in a, a huge audience, if you paid them well and treated them well, then that money would just come back to them. It was just a cost of doing business. And so for two years, uh, we were with uh, mostly Willie's expert uh, negotiations. The gentleman is an amazing broadcaster and an incredible negotiator. God bless you, Will. Um, we, uh, we eventually moved over to Jack and not only did we move over, we went, well, we want, we don't want to move over on kiss. We want to go on a new station. And so at first they envisioned putting us on X, which was the copy of C Fox. And we went, well, that's, we're just, that's not what we need to do. We're just going to be on a, on a new rock station. So we went, uh, in one of the meetings, uh, we had sat together and came, come up with a list of about 600 songs. And we had the idea that you didn't have to be a rock station, classic rock. You didn't have to do that. You didn't have to be country. You didn't have to be just pop. You could just play a collection of amazing music. And, uh, it was a very radical idea at the time. Now, also, at the same time, although we didn't know it, and uh, nor did the people in Winnipeg know it, but Bob FM was coming along, and they had the exact same idea. So we were in our silos, growing the same ideas. We we didn't know that the that we were both working on that same you know classic hits idea. So we came with a uh, a list of 600, 800 songs, and uh, eventually, over time, when Jack came on the air, we were supposed to be uh, hosting the show. Uh, day one, but uh, because of a 
non-compete, uh, we, we couldn't go on the air. Uh, although we knew we were going there and nobody else did. So I was driving on and listening to the radio one day and suddenly, um, there is the stream of music coming out of kiss FM. Uh, that is what is now known as the classic hits format, but it's in Vancouver. It was so incredibly successful, not necessarily because of Larry and Willie or anybody else involved. The reason it was successful was that for 25 years, all those songs had not been played on Vancouver radio. So all the music from the eighties had been pushed aside and had not been heard. Suddenly you've got these, all these songs that, Oh my God, you've, you haven't heard them in 20 years. And not only that it's Willie Nelson to Madonna, to Judas priest, to the Beatles, to Dean Martin. Uh, it was, that's eclectic right there. That was, uh, that what? was the way top 40 was back in the day, yeah. because that's I've right. said it before, you could play Helen Reddy and I am woman one yeah. minute and the next you're playing stairway to heaven by Led Zeppelin. For and sure. that was a typical train wreck that worked, but yeah. uh, you're, you're bringing up a very interesting point and it's about a misconception about having choice. It's like, mm. uh, well, I like uh serious XM because there's 200 channels, but nothing's mm. on. Or I have 10,000 uh, songs that I have in my, my file, but somehow yeah. I get bored. The reality is, is that people like a well-curated list that has enough familiar music in it, but a few surprises that makes it interesting. And that's something that the iPod did uh, for a while, is that because of it was just such a weird, eclectic mix of music, is every once in a while, just by chance, it, you would hear a song that you haven't heard uh, in a million years, and it would, uh, it would strike a note. Mm. You know, or, yeah. and 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 I agree with you that a, a a typical winning radio station may only have six eight hundred songs in their uh, or in more their like three hundred these days. Yeah, or more three hundred. And back in the yeah. day, it was forty. But yeah. the point of it is, it sounds like a small number of songs, but the reality is, that's a damn good uh, cream rising to the top mm -hmm. that you would listen to day in and day out. So I think that that the reality is that people love the way radio people curate playlist and i think that that still remains to be a strong motivational factor the if question is what do we what do we got to do to save radio because radio's taking it hard right now well you've come to the right place uh <laughs> you know i have uh, i have some uh, ideas uh i have a, a, an incredible idea for a format uh, that I'm not going to talk about right here, uh, but I have talked to some people about. I think I think it would be as successful as Jack has been, and Jack was off the top. There were 110 Jack radio stations at one time around the world coming from that idea that we had in Vancouver. Uh, it, it's you know one of the great uh, format inventions. Once, once, once management management changed there, we had people coming in going, uh, we have to figure out what the format is. And we were going like, no, dude, the idea is it isn't a format. And so that's when the enshittification of the whole thing uh, started, where it was like, oh, we, uh, we need to figure out why this works. Well, you don't know why it works. The reason it works is because it's so different than anything. It's totally unpredictable. Uh, and the value is in music that you, that people have not, not heard and the way that it's that it's presented. Um, so I, I had another idea, which interestingly, uh, about six months ago, a gentleman phoned me and presented my own idea to me uh, for a new format, which has just started on the air, by the way. It is an idea I had about seven years ago, which was to use classic uh, broadcasters who uh, uh, had disappeared from the air. So the same idea as songs that have not been played now. Oh, here are your classic broadcasters coming back. Uh, and to have them talk about stories. I so my that. idea back seven years ago was, okay, let's get Red Robinson. Let's get Doc Harris. These are all Vancouver legendary broadcasters. Let's get, uh, you know, some of the great broadcasters. And we'll just ask, what are your favorite 25 stories about meeting celebrities? What are your favorite 25 moments about uh, things that have happened in the industry? What are your favorite 25 moments in music history? And you just take this stuff and you basically rotate it around with music that supports those stories. So all it is, is you're getting these recordings and now you're, you're spinning all these stories around And Oh my God, it's Doc Harris and it's Red Robinson and it's Rick Honey and it's, you know, yeah, uh, you know, it's funny you should say that because essentially that's what the last angry DJ is all about is that 
We're talking about things that were good then and things that happened that were interesting that people are curious about. They're curious about how did songs get on charts? How did they mm -hmm. create the charts? What was the, what were the formats du jour? All of those things uh, seem to be striking a chord. We're small, we're growing, but it seems to you know attach itself to a lot of people because they want that. They want a little bit of that. Uh, well, I want it because I'm 69 years old and I'm no longer relevant for radio, as I've been told. But well, I can you know still what? kill it. I'm telling you, life is the story that you tell, people. So just by you saying, I am not relevant to broadcasting anymore, do you know what you've just done? You're not well, relevant I've to broadcasting anymore. I've just given permission anymore. to not make me relevant anymore. <laughs> no. Yeah. That's what makes uh, me angry. Damn it. Right. So, so, you know, don't talk in those terms. Don't talk in terms, anybody, don't talk, talk, listen to what you're saying. Listen to in life, listen to what you're saying. Listen to the story that you tell because life minute by minute is the story that you tell. And so tell your story well and realize what you're saying. Uh, oh no, I guess I'm uh, old and washed up and tired. Yeah. Guess what? You're old and washed up and tired, Lair, because that is, that's what you're presenting. So don't present that. Absolutely. <laughs> present. 100% you know, agree I, with you. I don't want to go all uh, all Anthony Robbins. No, no, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, ironically, I don't believe in that, but uh, and I'll still uh. take me kicking and screaming till the last uh, ratings book goes. But it, right. it, it's a very interesting phenomenon to compare what the way things used to be and the way that things are and how they yep. changed. Like, and there's, as it soon is as going Jack, back. And as soon as Jack was, was popular, I would have been thinking about what's next because there was an aero format before that, which was very popular, but it burned out and that had right. to be replaced by something else. All aero was, was CBS playing 70s songs, you know, mm. and, and Larry, you know, high rotation. On that note too, you know, and I see people do this all the time. They self sabotage. And I know I, I realize I'm, I'm younger than you guys, but, but I feel like I, I definitely don't think I'm going to change 20 years from now because my, my policy is that as somebody who is deeply entrenched in technology that needs to understand what's going on, I need to work really hard every single day keeping up because mm -hmm. like you're saying, Larry, I mean, you're, you're, you're only irrelevant if you just let things slide and become complacent. And I feel like there's, and to Mitch's point too, um, you know, someone uh, like, like you, Mitch, there's no reason why you can't contribute in some way, you know, um, at your age. And I, I think that's this, uh, it's a mindset. It's, it's to me, it's a cop out when somebody tells me, Oh, I'm too old to learn this new thing. I'm like, that's I, I've been practicing. Also. Uh, welcome to Kmart. What can I do? For you? <laughs> that's right. You make a, you make a fine pot of coffee. That's uh, that's one thing. Um, Alex, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. And, and yeah. I, I truly believe that. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing with you, Larry, is that I, I appreciate what you're saying because it makes sense. A story is a story. If it's funny, it's funny. It doesn't have anything to do with your age or your, your inclination, so to speak. It, uh, it, it works. It's like classic rock. What an interesting format. They're not making it anymore. And why is it yeah. you know, scoring huge numbers well, in different markets? It's a, it's, it's a uh, phenomenon. You know, the, the, the most streamed music uh, on any platform is uh, the the classic tunes, and they're not going to go away for a long, long time. Um, so, you know, classic hits and classic rock are are, are still an enormous thing. But uh, but w what happens is there's an there's another thing I I observe about radio some time ago, which was best practices. So, all all stations, all networks, all people are best practice so we've got to the point where we've decided what the best practices are so for example uh the radio station must have a logoed vehicle the radio station must have a logoed tent the radio station must have rolls of logoed vinyl the radio station must show up at events uh and have uh two disinterested people who are totally outside of the format uh hiding out looking at their phones uh trying to uh, earn a few bucks um to represent the station and so what happens then is let's say there's a concert and i mean this stuff doesn't even happen anymore because there's no budget for it but at that point there would be you know station x station two and station seven they all look the same Everybody's got a tent. Everybody's got a vehicle. So best practices is part of what took the creativity out of everything. So I once talked to uh, somebody 
of of power and, and presented my idea of best practices and why particularly uh, we had to think differently in that way. And it's very difficult. It's very difficult to actually spend time and be creative and to step out. And, you know, I was like, OK, if if the best practice, we've reached best practices and everybody looks the same. What we need to do is go back to we show up with a marching band, uh, you know, throwing out, uh, you know, money or something. Uh, you know, that's that's now the best practices. Let everybody else do that. How can you stand out? You stand out by having uh, the blue cow in the video, you know, uh, which is a famous story from Eurythmics and Sweet Dreams. Why, you know, why, why is there a blue cow in there when you have beautiful Annie Lennox? And they went, well, the idea is it's going to stand out. Eventually, was it Seth, Seth that wrote the book uh, called, called The Purple Cow? And, you know, thinking outside of where you are. So we've all got to best practices. Somebody has got to go, Screw the research. Screw everything. I mean, COVID was a perfect time for radio to blow itself up. It was a perfect time. The world has changed. It's not the same crap anymore. Stop playing the same 100 songs. You know, uh, do something Do something interesting. Not safe. You know, it's living on a prayer one more time. Uh, you know, we know that song. We know that. We love it. Every, does everybody love it? Everybody loves it. So we can, you know let's do something, something a little more different, but it takes incredible confidence, uh, to, to do that. And, um, the structure of broadcasting is not going to allow that to happen. Larry, I love your, I love your enthusiasm for Uh, the art form of radio and, uh, it comes through and it's inspiring, uh, to do it. Um, what's the next big thing for you? you What's your big move? Um, I, am still doing uh, Jack Radio, spinning vinyl records, Jack up the 80s. Uh, it's, uh, they tell me it's quite a popular show. Something has happened out of that that I really didn't expect is that I've become the vinyl 80s guy. And so now I have been out spinning 80s vinyl. Again, not the stuff that everybody hears all the time. I purposely play the stuff nobody hears uh, or has heard in a long, long time. But I was there, so I know these songs. I know these songs. Uh, and so now I've uh, I have an opportunity to open up concerts, spinning vinyl records, playing 80s music. And it is unbelievable. The Barnside Festival is coming up uh, this fall out in Ladner uh, in the Vancouver area. And I will be playing vinyl uh, between Loverboy, The Odds and Widemouth Mason on stage. So, I mean, I didn't envision this happening. But, man, when I get out there and I start playing these records, I mean, I I opened up for my friends in the band Strange Advance, who had some enormous, great songs. I recently opened up spinning records for them. People were coming up. I mean, I, I had a lady come up and say, I am so in love with you right now. And it was like, you know, I'm married, right? Uh, it was, <laughs> uh, you know, the effect on people is fantastic. So that's that's one of the things I do. I also, as I've told you, I am incredibly uh, interested in vintage electronics. So I have. Right yeah, here let's t- let's talk about that. A, what do you got to show us? So this is a uh, this is a box of rented equipment that just came back from Final Destination. Are you familiar with Final Destination? Oh yeah, the franchise. Uh, Final Destination Bloodlines. They're still making being produced that stuff. In how many? That's like twenty-five movies. I don't know. I've I don't know, that. but you know, keep on making it and keep on phoning me. Uh, so, final destination. My friend Ringo, not that Ringo, but another Ringo, Spencer and Haida. So they are prop masters, and they come to me, Ringo particularly, because he knows I'm a you know absolutely crazy about vintage electronics, and I've got you know everything from the last century. So he comes to me, and so this box has uh has just come back from the rental uh he says uh are you nervous about this and i go well what do you mean he says uh it's in a scene where a band is playing in a restaurant and some woman comes in with a machete uh-uh. uh he goes if anything happens to your equipment we'll replace it and i go so uh you know so this is a sennheiser 421 microphone that you will classic see classic radio in- mic yes am radio fantastic i remember in the day uh, working at the VOCM network in, in St. John's uh, and across Newfoundland, they would have an artist draw the call letters on the side of the microphone. Uh, if you see one of those around, let me know. I, I 
I just love that stuff. Actually, uh, on, recently a general on the, a note about yep. the 421, and I thought I don't, I haven't talked to Sennheiser engineers. That metal band that goes across the grill, separating that, like there's like two halves of that. I always wondered right. if they put that metal band there to minimize plosives from talking mm. close, but I, I don't know if that. I wonder with certainty. Uh, it's uh, you know they used to say that you could uh, you could hold it in front of a, a gun and shoot it, and it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't have a plosive. Uh, recently, there's a gentleman named Mark Stadnick, Lance Stadnick. Lance Stadnick was, um, he worked with Brian Adams and he toured the world with Brian Adams, uh, as his assistant, uh, tech and et cetera, et cetera. And so these guys, and there's a few guys like that, Randy Bachman as well. When they, when they would tour through towns, they would go into, uh, junk shops, electronic shops, music shops, and they would look for, uh, interesting electronics and et cetera. So Lance recently passed away. He had an incredible collection of pop culture materials, like unbelievable stuff, but he also had vintage electronics. And so I went on this auction and I got eight for my company, uh, eight different, very, very different microphones. Uh, look at this. This is from Germany, 1933. Do you have an Echoplex? What, what is that microphone? I, I know uh, this. I don't know the name of it. Oh, Sorry, wow. I I would in my notes, but I do know that it's German, 1933. It's a does, it's a ribbon mic from way back. This does, is a a British ribbon mic tannoy. Wow. Uh, and these mics, do they work? Uh, they probably do. I mean, I I've just got them. So, uh, this is a uh, ribbon microphone uh, from France. Uh, this is a ribbon microphone, a Shaftesbury from England. It's a copy this of the 44. This is a ribbon microphone uh, from Japan. Um, so these came from that collection of Lance Stadnick. So uh, with movies, they don't, they don't necessarily want them to work. They just want them to be props. And so something else that happened with me is that I, because I've always been so fascinated with microphones in the 90s, I started to collect them. And I thought, hold on, Vancouver, Hollywood North. So I got the, uh, the URL microphonerentals.com. And so it's been on since like 92. So without any sort of Google uh, help or, or, you know, payments, uh, it's if you if you search uh, vintage microphones or classic microphones or vintage prop microphones, microphonerentals.com will probably come to the top of your search. So because of that, I get inquiries from all over the world for right. productions. Uh, you know, if you've seen uh, When We Rise was an ABC show, uh, Bad Times at the El Royale with Jeff Bridges. Their uh, part part of that movie is all about uh, the love interest between between the main character and the singer. And right. so the singer is in a recording session. And so they come to me and go, what does a 1962 recording session look like? And I go, I'll, ch I'll show you. So set up tape machines, set up all the microphones, all the stands, everything. And so I didn't envision being a, co a consultant. I envisioned somebody coming and renting the mics to put them in films, but I never en envisioned being a consultant. Uh, reel to reel tape machines. They were throwing them out. So I, I grew up using tape machines uh, as a kid and in school. And so I started to collect these and I started to transfer tapes. So now my reel to reel to digital.com is one of the main tape uh, transfer houses in Vancouver. Um, so I also love to mix and restore vintage music um, from So you tape have an or Amp Ampex 351 or 440 sitting there in the back somewhere? Uh, I have a amp. Yeah, no, 600, I have maybe, uh, a small six scooters. I have, I have actually the brains from a 600 over there, uh, which, which, uh, taken out of the tape machine. I use as a preamp. That's a popular thing in, uh, in recording. Yeah. Uh, I also have a, uh, uh, along with my, my partner, Jamie Anstey, we have regenerator records and, uh, Jamie has the Canadian music archives. The Canadian music archives probably has the largest collection of master, master reel to reel tapes certainly in Western Canada, if not Canada, uh, and Regenerator Records, uh, we have um, reissued music from Vancouver, including Terry Jacks, the Poppy family, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I've been doing this stuff, uh, even when I was doing Larry and Willie show and radio, I've been doing this stuff. I just didn't make it public and also my own music. So so how about how about old uh, plate reverbs like uh, Echoplex oh, or the uh, I have uh, a, an AKG spring reverb which yep. is right there. You can't you can't Springs see it. Springs are uh, great. I love old spring reverbs. Yeah, so this one actually came out of a radio station uh, quite valuable, uh, not functioning sadly, a very very intricate. 
but yeah, I have a, a very large collection of, uh, of vintage uh, studio equipment, which has become incredibly valuable and incredibly desirable. I was very early on it and, uh, you know, people were throwing them out basically. And so I'll take it. Uh, so the room I'm in is, is like a working museum and I have, uh, probably two buildings full of vintage electronics. Larry, that Thank is you, that a, re that's a real RCA 44. That's not uh, a recreation that, uh, that you got back there. Uh, no, man, no recreations. Thank you. And, this, and, uh, oh, how about you, this one? Can you see this? Oh yeah, I can see that. Yeah. This is a, uh, a KU2A called the skunk microphone because of this, uh, Mel Blanc was the main voice of the Warner Brothers, That's Bugs right. Bunny. He yep. did all those voices. This was his favorite microphone. Uh, this was uh, invented in the 30s by RCA. I love RCA microphones um, to uh, use over over film sets. Okay. Um, it's like a it's, boom mic or? You know, well, it's, it's a ribbon microphone. Yeah, so it's bi-directional. Yeah, that wouldn't really work all that well yeah. for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some of them, this, these, these were made actually, that one particularly is made so that, so that it rejects from the back and it, it takes from, from the right in front, which for ribbon microphones, like, uh, like this one, this one is figure of eight, right? So it's equal, equal yeah. on both sides. So they, they figured out with this one how to, how to direct a ribbon mic. This microphone actually comes from XEW, the first Mexican television station in Mexico City. It is, uh, it's Telesistema Mexico, and it is microphone number 11. This microphone here came from a radio station in Minnesota. So I love, I love the history of these microphones, who, who might have used them, where they come from. Every one of them has a story, and uh, to me, it's fascinating. And it is, again, amazing that something something that i'm so interested in has become yeah. part of a thing. part of my business it's yeah. a thing and do you you yeah. know your collection actually it really reminds me you know uh, recording engineer sylvia massey i do she's i got uh, a mass i'm in contact with with sylvia yeah she's got uh, a yeah. museum and she's uh, uh, like the audio much, studio yeah yeah your yeah. your passion for microphones really reminds me of 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 her and how much she's into them and i'm i'm uh I, I love I, Sylvia. Yeah, I uh, I would love to have a collection like that, but sadly, the the resale value or the the resale value of these is uh, has gone up astronomically. It's amazing. I mean, you For can't sure. buy most people these days won't be able to afford like a U sixty seven a vintage one because it's going to be what twenty thousand dollars now for for one of those mics. So that's uh, that's incredible. I any... almost bought. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I almost bought uh, from um, in the when I, when I first started to do this. Uh, I almost bought the um, Neumann uh, U67 that was used in the Imagine video with John Lennon. It was for sale then for something like seven thousand dollars. That's and cheap. I went, my God, that's cheap. That's, yeah, well, Back. it wasn't seven thousand dollars. Was not cheap then. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it sounds cheap if you know the value of microphones now. But try and get seven thousand dollars back then, my friend. Uh, so I was like, yeah, I think that would be amazing to have that microphone, but it's just too much. And now, of course, I go well. You know, I should have got it right. Who knows should what have that is now? What yeah. was your first uh, microphone that you used on the radio? Can you recall? Uh, it was a uh, an Electro Voice six thirty one, the hammer mic, the the, the six thirty five A, the pre yes, precursor. That, yeah, uh, so the ubiquitous uh, reporter mic. Um, yeah, that was the first. I remember when we first went into the radio station CFLW in Wabash, Labrador. Um, the it was in the basement of the house and the manager uh his wife uh their bedroom was right on top of the control room and they were uh -oh. they had those they had those uh carbon headsets and so i had a set of cost headsets and i went i wonder if my own headset will work and so i brought it in the work and even though it was in mono because the the jack was wired for mono and my headset was stereo it was just it sounded amazing so then i had to figure out on my own how to how to bridge and make it work in there but i remember uh one of the first nights i was on and i'm like okay so they just had a tiny little eight inch, eight inch speaker up there and i've got the music on and it's like uh you know disc so uh night fever dancing queen you know that kind of stuff whatever was going on and and i got the volume up and i'm like holy crap i can't believe this so the hotline rings mitch speaking of the hotline the hotline rings and uh yeah larry yeah it's keith Oh, hi, Keith. Keith Pittman was the, uh, was the manager. He goes, turn that goddamn monitor down. Click. So I go monitor, monitor. 
what does he mean by monitor? So I go out in the reception area. They had, they always had a radio on. So I went out and turned the radio down. I guess like, I didn't know what monitor, what's a monitor. <laughs> That's, you know, that's you haven't hilarious. lived until you've gotten your Pro 4 AA headsets on and um, you keep slamming them down after playing a record and you put uh-huh. them on one day and the oil is dripping out of it down your shirt. That's right. something only radio people that wear those headphones. And the uh, uh, the magnetic ones you're referring to were Clevites made Clevites. out of fake light. Tiny little Clevites and they were like shooting razor blades yes. through your brain. They, you could hear yourself really well. But they were horrible, horrible for your hearing. In fact, I, I, I should I know those. all radio people be careful because you're going to have tinnitus. Oh, Did yeah. I say tinnitus? Yes. Yeah. What? Be- yeah, because my headphones would be as loud as, would, used to be as loud as the monitors sitting on the table. I could walk down yeah. the hall and hear my headsets. Yes, headsets were a big thing. And Alex, I butted in last time. You, you were trying to say something here. And yeah, had, yeah, know, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> I just had, on, on the topic of ribbon microphones, I had a question about. Uh, or the RCA stuff specifically, have uh-huh. you had a chance yep. to try the the newer recreations from AEA? Because I know they have a lot of stockpile of, of original parts, and, and I've never listened to an mm. original 44, but I've sold them and I've tested the recreations. They sound incredible, uh-huh. but I don't know how they compare yeah. to the originals. I really I honestly can't tell you because I'm not interested in recreations. I'm, I'm, I like the... the original stuff but i will tell you that uh like this microphone i use in recording all the time uh it's it hasn't been nothing's been done to it most of the electronics i have have been restored by a number of different people kurt palm hey kurt uh, uh the real to real tech uh and also a gentleman named jack weeb who was the um right. jack weeb was the director of engineering for rogers radio in vancouver and uh, upon his retirement we found each other and I would show up at Jack's place with, oh, you know, it's this vintage Gibson amplifier from the 50s. Right. And he would go, uh, do you have a schematic? And I go, no, I don't. And he goes, OK, leave it with me. And so everything he worked on, he, I have a hand drawn schematic from Jack Weeb, uh, who's wow. now who's now passed on. So I, I love I just love the real vintage stuff. And I'm sure that these microphones microphones now are so inexpensive. New microphones, um, you know. Like literally when I, when I started to record on four track and all I had was this microphone, I was lucky to have it. Um, I would, you know, I would record and then I would, because, because I've grown up singing in choirs, I love to sing harmony. And so I figured out how to sing harmony with myself. And then I, I would use the same microphone, but it sounded like a me. And so finally I got another microphone. And I realized, Oh, hold on. If I use this mic and then that one, something happens. And so now when I'm producing even my own backing vocals or backing vocals in a project, and I suggest this to anybody is, is you're going to use, if you have different microphones, use a different microphone on each voice on each track and something incredible happens. Um, I've never yeah, actually I thought, I've never actually thought to, to do that. To, to, well, to use this. That's, that's really, I'm going to have to file that away for, Check it out, man. That's, I'm that's... still trying to recover from the fact that each of us have a variation of the 414 uh-huh. right here in front of us, and we all picked the same mic. You know, Without a, yeah. We did not talk about this in advance. Yep. Do you know about just, this microphone, just, Larry? Because somebody turned me on to this, and I don't know any. Yeah. I didn't know much about this mic. This is a Stellar X2 from Tech Zone in California. They use a Japanese okay. capsule, and it's custom design. This uh, they claim it has a a K67. Uh, style sound to it, and this is one of the smoothest sounding microphones I've I've used. It's the closest I've tried. So many eighty seven clones, and they always seem right. to fall short. This one sounds amazing, and this is I think a three hundred dollar Canadian microphone. Yeah. So yeah. you know, it's like you yeah, never. I always tell people because I sell microphones all the time. People always tell me, "What's the best microphone?" I'm like, there is no whatever whatever works for your voice. Yeah. And price for doesn't sure. necessarily mean that is the best microphone. I had a guy that came well, in the, one time who spent to, bought a U87, and he had a Universal Audio 610 preamp, and he goes, "Ah, it doesn't sound good. I can't get any good results. I did 20 takes, can't get anything good. I plug a 57 to a new it right in front of him to test it out, and he goes, "That sounds amazing. What'd you do? I just plugged the microphone in, man." It's it's not the gear. Yeah. It's not the gear. <laughs> no, 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 for sure. Uh, uh, it's and, also and, the re- relationship you develop with your microphones. Now, the first yeah. mic I ever bought is the U87. That's an original Ooh, behind me. You dog. And I have a relationship with it. You know, Alex yeah. has picked on me about saying that, but no, no, uh, I, I know it. how to work it because when I, I do voiceover it. work, that's the mic I use. Yeah, there is a, there's a sweet this. spot. 
I, I don't know what the the model number is. There's the new Neumann that is uh, for broadcasting, and it's got a, a very distinctive, stubby, shorter thing. And Looks you like see, a you see, prow of a spaceship. Yes, exactly. Uh, like I love Neumann microphones, and uh, when we were at CFOX uh, in Vancouver on Richard Street, I think there was like sixteen U eight U sixty sevens. Not 87s. There was 87s and, uh, you know, like, oh, you know, what? Uh, um, but this new Neumann microphone, uh, you know, I love you, Neumann, but boy, that is a bad microphone. Is it? Are That's, you talking about the uh, the BCM 705? It's got yeah. like a weird yeah, right angled. It's a dynamic. There's mic, a I think. dynamic yeah. version and a condenser yeah. version. Right. So so I, I've used that on the air. And as long as like every microphone has got a sweet spot, as you uh, referred to. Mitch, uh, like, you know, there's a, there's a point where, hold on, you're too far away. You're too far. Now you've got that proximity effect. Okay. That is the sweetest spot. If that's the sound you're looking for. So those microphones, I found that as soon as, and back to your comment about falling off, uh, you know, going off microphone and, and whatever, uh, that as soon as you're out of that sweet spot and there's only that sweet spot, as soon as you're out of it, you're, you almost can't even hear the voice. So something about that microphone, um, not my favorite. I love you, Neumann, but not my favorite. Yeah, and that's actually, that's one of the reasons why, and I own so many ElectroVoice uh, microphones because they're, they're, they're variable D patented tech. I mean, I've got RE27s, I have RE20s, yeah. and I find for people that have, when I get a lot of guests that come in here into the studio, they have zero mic technique. They've never, they're nervous uh -huh. when they come in. Yeah. And so right. when they go slightly off mic, they can go three inches off access and their voice sounds consistent. If they eat the mic, there's only a slight volume increase, but I don't get that, that bass buildup. So I find for a lot of newbies, the RE20 style microphones work really well. Did, did you ever actually, your, you, uh, did you use 58, one of those ever? A Sure 58 always sounds good. I don't care how yeah, expensive yeah. they get. 57, 58, you know. Yeah. Uh, I've never used one of those RE20s or, or I have as a guest, but not. Not on the radio. Uh, you know, in the early days, yeah. in the early days, it'd be uh, the 421 through AM radio. Yeah. Uh, eventually, the first time I used a Neumann was at Radio Oz in St. John's, an incredible station yeah. in its day. Uh, you know, wow. They actually had an automated. Speaking of early automation, they had that that uh, what is that system called where where they had the system of carts and they had all these uh, Revox ninety uh, nines, yeah, carousels and uh, you know Schaefer Insta automation, Instacarts, yeah, yeah. So they had that there, and this is my my first welcome to uh, to actually the computer is running the show. So the computer was running the show. So there was some sort of code like you know Escape Seven. Now I I had never used a computer at that point, and so the first minute of the first couple of minutes of every every show would be like give me back control give me back control okay i've got it all right you know um but that was the first time uh, they had they had some pretty cool equipment and then uh at cfrw in winnipeg they had a u87 uh then it was um you know the sm7 um Boy, if you don't know microphones, we've certainly turned into Charlie Brown's teacher, haven't and we? What, wow, wow, what microphones wow. were were you guys using on the Larry and Willie show back in the '90s? Do you recall? Did they get switched out or, or a lot, or did nope. you guys use consistently the same mics? It was the same control room from the moment we were there uh, until we moved over to bum 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 the Dark Tower, the TD Tower, as it's affectionately was known. Anyways, I don't know what they call it now. Uh, <laughs> the dark tower um yeah so it was the same control room it was almost exactly the same control room and they were uh u87s u67s uh all neumann things and and then you had a lot of groups and bands and uh performers coming in and so uh they were playing live in there and that was just a perfect setup for that i remember uh <laughs> there's a funny story about peter frampton so peter frampton was going to come in and play on the show and uh he had a new album and this was the beginning of like uh you know oh it's very hard to get your new music heard so he was willing to show up at eight in the morning and, and play some new music so this was also at the start of uh of the adat which was digital recording on uh, v okay. vhs tapes uh so um i had patched out from all these microphones as best as i could patched into this machine and so it was kind of running running uh over under a blanket uh, you know, didn't ask anybody, but interestingly, once we had set up the guy, Peter Frampton had a guy with him, 
who was like the guitar tech and he came in first and he's like, oh, OK, so where's Peter going to be? I know, you know, over there, this microphone. Good. He set up his amplifier, tune up his guitar, et cetera. And, uh, you know, OK, so when does he got to OK, you got to be in here at 10 after eight. OK, so 10 at, before he leaves, he goes. Uh, yeah, when when Peter comes in, uh, don't mention, uh, you know, don't mention the small, uh, small penis. And so we go like, what? He goes, no, you know, don't talk about that. And so he then he leaves. So at that time, we had Kerry Marshall, the veteran, uh, amazing news, newscaster. And so, Willie, we look at each other. We go like, what, what the hell is he talking about? So we, we intercom down to, to Kerry and we go like, what's the deal with the small, uh, you know, penis for Peter Frampton? He goes, oh, well, the plaster casters, uh, you know, these, these are ladies that actually took plaster castings of, of rock stars. Uh, genitalia, right? Yeah, I know. Uh, it happened. Plaster casters. They uh, they said that on the top of the scale was Jimi Hendrix and Huey Lewis, and at the very, 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 very bottom of the scale was Peter Frampton. It was so very just, cold. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, so just as Carrie tells us that, the door opens, and here's Peter Frampton standing in front of us. And of course, all we can think about is, mm, don't mention, don't mention, don't mention. He gave, he was wonderful. He's beautiful. He gave an incredible performance that we actually ended up getting uh, rights to release later on, uh, Peter Frampton. But yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah, that's a visual. That I don't think I'm. Ta- I'm. I'm, gonna I'm, be I'm sorry. I'm me. sorry if that hurts, but uh, but it, it happened. And that that kind of thing, uh, you know, I have a hundred stories that uh, it's just it's a great story. It's and uh, I, and I agree with your whole point earlier. You made about it's about the music, the stories behind the music, how music gets there how it charts. You even mentioned uh, Terry Jackson. Uh, I was one of the first guys to play Seasons in the Sun. Horrible horrible song. Sorry, Terry, but it just wasn't that good. I also Uh, uh, charted... uh, Believe me. Believe me. You made up my my, uh, light or whatever the heck, uh, Debbie You light up my life? Yeah, that's it. You light up my whatever. That was another song that I'm responsible for. And uh, I'm sorry I unleashed it upon Uh, the entire North American. Terry's Seasons in the Sun. So Terry and I have become uh, incredibly good friends because he lives very close to here. Uh, And no, it's okay, Mitch. Uh, You know, uh, believe me, he'll he'll, he'll just laugh Um, because uh, Terry's done quite well. Matter of fact, it was just used in John Wick, in the trailer for John Wick. Uh, So that song, Seasons in the Sun, believe me, uh, no matter what you think of it, it has resonated with people so incredibly. Um, so, uh, it, it is amazing because I run his social media accounts and the contacts from people and the way that that song, uh, you know, that, that song, when it came out in 1973, sold in one year, 9 million, no, 11 million physical copies in one year. It, it was, uh, an amazing story. A, a, yeah, an incredible one of story. the most instantly recognizable guitar intros yep. of all time and that's his for dun, top dun, 40 dun, 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 dun. yep great, i have actually stuff. not in this studio but in my studio my other studio i have the multi-track master tape for that song how does that sound uh it the, sounds the amazing song or I, the tra- machine? <laughs> I transferred it um and there are a number of interesting things about it uh, it's a 16 track two inch tape it was recorded at uh at mushroom studios what became mushroom studios uh, Mr. Flicker, the engineer, and Terry, the incredible producer. The guy is a genius producer and writer. Um, so Susan Jacks is singing, uh, God rest her, she's gone now. Susan Jacks is singing back in vocal. Uh, and David Foster playing the piano. Uh, Kit Hendricks is playing the drum kit. Uh, Doug Edwards playing the bass. These are all legendary Vancouver session musicians. Uh, but one interesting thing that is not heard uh, is on track 16, there is a tabla track. A tabla is a South Asian, uh, which was played by Satwan Singh. Satwan has also recently passed away. Sat um, played a tabla track. He played tablas with the Poppy family. Sat, so there's a, 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 a... Which way you going, Billy? That's the Poppy family. You got that right. Um, so that that track... 16 with sat playing the uh the tabla is not in the mix so i did a mix that features the tabla and it suddenly turns it into like a dance track 
Amazing. There is another, like, do we have time for another story about that? Go ahead. <laughs> That's all so, yours. So with the Poppy family, Terry Jacks uh, and the Poppy family, Susan, that one, Guy Sabell are uh, opening up for the Beach Boys in Vancouver in the 60s. And they were hanging out backstage and Terry got on really well with the members of the Beach Boys. Um, and so when Brian uh, had his issues and he was lying in bed uh, for, for those times, um, the Beach Boys got together and they went, well, what are we going to do? Who are we going to work with? Somebody said, um, what about that guy in Vancouver, Terry Jacks? He is a pretty, he's makes pretty amazing music. So they phoned up Terry, Terry came down and they were working. He said before he had recorded seasons in the sun seasons in the sun was written by Jacques Burrell from Brussels, France was translated by Rod McEwen. The Kingston family did a version of it. And K Terry remembered hearing the Kingston family uh, version on the radio and said, I know how to make that better because Lamora Bond is the story from a, a father to his dying son. Terry changed the idea that it be about lovers. Uh, and so that's all his idea. So he went to the Beach Boys and he said, I've got this idea. Remember the Kingston Trio song, the uh, Season of the Sun? They go, yeah, well, I think it can be a bigger hit if we do this to it. So they agreed and he produced a, ver a version of Seasons in the Sun in the studio in Brian Wilson's living room. Brian is upstairs going through his issues. He's in bed. Terry says he remembers Brian Wilson coming down in a bathrobe and going, it needs organ and going over to the organ and uh, maniacally playing the organ. So weeks later, uh, the pressure is enormous. The engineer phones up Terry and says, Terry, you got to get over here right away. Brian is running around with a pair of scissors. He's going to cut up the tape. So, he rushes over and they have a mix on a two track mix and the master tape is saved. And so for years and years and years, it was not released. Uh, but recently it was found remixed and put out on a beach boys rarities album. So that's wow. That is cool. that that's that song. And that whole thing uh, just has such a history to it. It's, it's amazing. And it's incredible to, uh, uh, to for me as a kid, I listened to the Poppy Family as a kid, and then Concrete Sea, which was Terry's big hit in Canada before Seasons of the Sun, for me was one of my favorite songs. So for me to be associated with him and to uh, to help him with his uh, uh, management, etc., is that's an amazing, yeah, absolute, absolutely. Was this uh, was this back in the days of Canadian content? That's yep. a whole thing. Yeah, this is actually before Canadian content. Canadian CanCon came in somewhere early seventies. Uh, the Poppy family and also his original band, the Chessmen. Now I remember when I first started to transfer this, Terry was also very smart and he kept all his master tapes. So Jamie and I, uh, we transferred every one of his master tapes and it's enough tapes to, you know, to fill a, a room. Uh, he was very smart in that. Here's another story. The reason that he kept his, his royalties is that as a young man, um, he left uh, university. He was, his parents wanted him to be an architect. And he was a very skilled um, artist and that kind of thing. And he decided, no, I want to I want to do music. So we went down to Los Angeles and he had a song that was called Granny's Rail. And it was about Mitch. Let's see if this will start ringing any bells for you. It was about a drag racing granny. Granny's Rail. And so we went into a publisher and they went, uh, sure, kid, uh, leave the tape with us. And so he came back to Canada. And uh, months later, one of Terry's friends phoned and said, Terry, your song's on the radio, but they've changed it. And do you know what the song was? Go, Granny, go, Granny, go, Granny, yeah. go. She's a little old lady from Pasadena. Pasadena. Go, Granny, go, Granny. And Dean. So they took his chorus, go, Granny, go, Granny, go, Granny, go. And the idea of a drag racing Granny, they stole his idea. And once he realized, hold on, they took my idea. I'm going to pay for all my recording sessions. I'm going to keep all the master tapes and I'm going to control it. Very, very smart move for, yeah, good, for that, good, for that man. Good stuff. Larry, how wow, you, such great we, stories. Yeah. I mean, we could, we could go for hours, but, uh, we, we don't, we don't want to keep you for too long. Um, just one last question specifically about master tape stuff. Uh, how does one, uh, how does one properly maintain and preserve tape? 
for for that mm-hmm. many decades? What do you have to do? It must right. it must not be transfer it. an easy thing. <laughs> Get it off yeah. the tape. Yeah, but you don't. You know, you still want. I've heard of I've heard of people transferring their masters and then chucking the tapes. Well, guess what? You know, technology changes all the time. Um, How I many just, times can you bake a tape? Uh, over and over and over again. Really good. Yeah, it does. It does nothing. The deal is that tapes before um, the uh, American energy crisis of 1973, the the availability of oil, which was used in the old formulation of tapes, the availability was, you know, people wanted it for their cars and, and for production. They wouldn't put it in the tapes. So they came up with a new formulation. So any tape that has a brown backing, don't bake. Those become brittle but they don't ha- suffer from something that is called sticky tape shed syndrome. Stiction. Mm. Yes. So what happened with this new formulation of tape is for some reason these years later, it's sitting there absorbing all this moisture. And the bonding that's because magnetic tape is all made up of tiny, tiny little particles magne- that are magnetized in a certain direction so that when 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 the magnet, when it goes over the head, the recording head, the magnet, it, it puts the, all these things in a certain direction. When the reverse happens and it goes over the playback head, then the same sound is created. And that's simply how, how that works. But what happens is with these sticky tapes, they, when, you, when you play them now, they immediately gum up all the parts of the machine and they start to slow down and you'll get, ey, 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 ey. you get a squeak happening. So there is a way to bake those tapes to preserve them, but it only lasts for maybe a week. Uh, It doesn't degrade the tape, so you need to transfer it pretty much right away uh, and then let it set again. You can bake it again, and you can, uh, in my opinion, I wasn't aware you could multiple bake. Yeah, you can bake uh, them over and over again. Was that maybe more than half of those master tapes were Grandmaster Ampex 456? Yuck. You don't like 456. Hey. I went to uh, Agfa, but that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, sadly, uh, some of the, uh, I mean, uh, in the day, I loved, I, I chose to use those tapes, and all my tapes are all sticky, <laughs> you know. Uh, but preserving, uh, I've just read another story. So, so regarding keeping master tapes and not throwing them out, now uh, you'll be familiar with the Beatles song Now and Then, where they took the John Lennon vocal and basically isolated it out. Yeah, and brought that was it amazing out. what they did with that. Fantastic. So I have some of those same programs. I've just I've just set up a new a new system where last week with my friend Rob Frith from Neptune Records, he found uh, Eleanor Collins. Eleanor Collins was an early singer, jazz singer in Vancouver. Uh, she was the first person of color to have a national jazz show. Matter of fact, she's the first person to have a jazz show nationally in Canada. She's the first person of color to have her own show in, in Canada. Amazing singer. So he found these acetate records, which are like one copy burnt into the record. And they typically, you know, they sound. So we transferred those. And using that ne- new technology, I was able to isolate her voice out of there like she is sitting next to you and I right now. Wow. The effect that this had on her family in the last week is an absolute joy, an absolute joy. Her daughter, I think uh, one of her daughters is, is in her 80s. And so to hear their mom singing now. So, so I believe uh, that using these programs now, I can, take, I can take a mixed mono tape and I can take the stems out. I can, I can take the drums out, the bass out the keyboard out, the vocals out. So now when you have this mono recording from way back, you can now put that into Pro Tools and make this amazing new recording. So I don't think this is the end of the technology. Brand new stereo mix. So so I don't think this is the end of the technology. And I had a crazy idea years ago that sometime in the future, what if from an audio tape, somehow AI now somehow could... Maybe there somehow video was recorded and nobody knew it, or maybe it can be it, maybe it can be taken from there and created. You know, who knows what's coming? Nobody could have pre- predicted this. I, I always thought it'd be cool to have uh, a station playing classic hits or whatever, but totally remixed by right. a famous famous pro- producer from today with a sure. completely different take on it. Wouldn't you find that interesting? A song you're used to hearing 
a Bachman Turner right. Overdrive or something. Yeah. Uh, and hearing it completely mixed well, differently. I think, well, well this that would be wild. I think what George Martin's son, Giles Martin, is doing with these new stereo. Fantastic. Have you, it's incredible. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's to me what the stereo mix yeah. should be like, what, what he did with it. Uh, because I envisioned mm-hmm. I envisioned that years ago because I did it with my own tapes and I did it for projects taking because then they were they were recording on four track machines. So they would record bass, drums and guitar on one track. They would record uh, vocals, lead vocals on another track. They record backing vocals and percussion often on a track. And then they would do what they called a reduction mix and they would bounce those down to one track, <clears> leaving <throat> them another three tracks to put stuff on. So I envisioned and started to do myself even before computers to take take recordings and to to take the original recordings and then sync them up with the new recordings so that the reduction mix you know like probably uh, you know pretty crappy mix from back in the day but being able to take those now sync them up and it took them a long while. I had that idea years and years before and I'm going like why don't they do that? And so with love uh, and then future projects, you know, there's nobody better to be doing this than Jaws Martin. Nobody better in the world. Be, well, you know, I'd like to help, yeah. but Larry, I think, well, we got, thanks we got so two shows in one here today. We got radio, yeah. we got uh, classic microphones, and we got classic recordings and recovering them. Great job. And Thank you. great to have you here, Larry. It was, it was wonderful. We'd hope to have you back sometime in the future when, when we have hundreds of listeners as opposed to one or two. But we have to start somewhere, and you're Absolutely. the man to make it happen. Well, thank you. And, uh, you know, if I can say anything in parting is that even though I'm known as a, as a radio broadcaster, uh, no, matter, no matter what it is that you believe in and you're interested in, there has never been a better time in the world to do what you're interested in and to, you know, let your freak flag fr- fly, as, as they used to say, uh, you know, do what you believe in and keep doing what you love, keep doing what you love. Do it. I mean, look, look at all the stuff that's, that's materialized for me. I've been doing it all my life. And so it's not only just radio, I still am incredibly passionate about radio, but all this other stuff too. So do what you love. Don't wait for somebody to go, well, I do it. If, uh, if they hired me to do it, bullshit, nobody's going to hire you to do nothing. You do it. You do what you believe in. You do what you love. And watch you what are, happens. You are you are total inspiration, Larry. And thank you so very thank much. Thank you so much, Larry. Alex. You get thank the you. last word today. I gotta go. I, I think I think uh, that that's well said. I think that's a perfect note. Uh, maybe in the future we'll have to have you on and, and again and and do something else. But uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your your busy uh, schedule to come on the show. So thank you very much, Larry. It's an honor to talk to you guys, and really nice to meet you. And uh, thanks to uh, everybody for for checking out your your. Uh, your podcast, podcast, vidcast, cast. Yeah, that. That's what it is. Thanks. I'll let Mitch have the last word. Uh, you just got the last word, my friend. Okay. And, uh, Larry All right. uh, did a great job of wrapping things up for us. So, there yeah, I think that uh, this podcast is a, is a labor of love. We're not going to get rich doing it, but yeah. we get to meet people like you, Larry, and uh, you, you're going to stay on our Rolodex forever. So watch out. Okay. Thanks kindly. I'll uh, I'll happily talk with you guys anytime. See you later. See you guys. Thanks for your help earlier, Alex, with all the uh, all the tech stuff.